Welcome everyone to our webinar on GDPR and tech regulation. Thank you so much for joining us. In this webinar, we're going to be comparing incident notification under the GDPR against new tech regulation. But before I go on, I'd like to make some introductions. So the lineup of speakers today are Charlie Guile. Charlie's an associate in our Field Fisher tech and data team. Hi, everyone. And L Callum, and L is a trainee in our tech and data team. Hi, everyone. And myself, I'm Kirsten Whitfield, and I'm a partner in Field Fisher's tech and data team. And I also lead our cyber breach team alongside James Walsh, who's also a partner in our tech and data team. So first off, let's have a look at the agenda. So what are we going to talk about on this webinar? So firstly, we're going to give some context to the proliferation of incident notification requirements that we're seeing coming about. We're going to give a bird's eye view of when the GDPR is applicable and compare that to when new tech regulations are going to be applicable to your organizations. We'll give a timeline for implementation of the new tech regulation. We're then going to move on to comparing the incident notification regimes across GDPR and new tech regulation. And we're particularly going to take a closer look at the thresholds for notification. Uh, and also the timeframes within which you need to make your notifications and how they differ from each other. Um, and spoiler alert, they are different. Um, we're going to make some uh, suggestions around actions that you could be taking to help get your organization ready. We're going to suggest some tools and resources to help get you ready. And then hopefully if we've got time at the end of the webinar, um, we'll be able to take some questions. Before I go on into the detail, um, I'm going to just give a little bit of a backdrop. Well, I don't think it's going to come as a surprise to anyone on this webinar if I say that cyber threats are reported to have been on the rise, and that's, that's year on year. So IBM, who annually publish their cost of a data breach report, um, have said in this year's report that the global average cost of a data breach is now $4.88 million dollars, which is a lot. And the top three countries are for costs. So this is the most expensive co countries in which to have a data breach are the USA, Middle East, and Benelux. Um, and I've actually snuck in three countries there with Benelux, so it's actually the top six. And in the report, they say what those costs are typically made up of. It's lost business, detection and escalation of incidents, the post-breach response and um, very appropriately and relevantly to this webinar, it's the cost of notifications. Now, under the new regime, what we're seeing is an expansion of incident notification requirements from GDPR onto um, uh, much more expansively uh, from personal data breach to much wider requirements um, around notifying incidents relating to systems, uh, breaches, um, exposing data that's not necessarily personal data. So it, it is really um, very much an expanded remit. Um, the other thing to note is that we are seeing um, much greater security measures now um, being prescribed. So we're moving from GDPR, which is very principles-based, into a much more specific set of um, regimes where they're actually specifying what the security measures are that you need to put in place. Um, and the other thing just to say is that also um, with the new tech regulation, a, a key theme is um, making sure that where we're seeing these cross-border threats to, um, to our, our data, our systems and people, that there is a cross-border response and solutions and much more information sharing. I shall hand over to Charlie to give you an update on when it's all going to apply to you. Sorry, Elle, if we just go back one slide. Thanks, Kirsten. So, yeah, as Kirsten noted um, on the agenda slide, we're covering quite a lot of different regulations in today's session. So we thought it'd be worthwhile just covering at a high level um, who those or which type of entities and organisations those different regulations apply to. Um, uh, this is obviously at a very high level and there are nuances with all of these. Um, but the GDPR, we have all become sort of well versed in, you know, being referred to as a controller and or a processor. Um, UK NIS 
Um, so this applies to operators of essential services. So that being organizations that operate any services that are deemed critical to the economy and the wider society. Um, so examples sort of include, you know, water, transport and energy. Um, and then we also have digital service providers um, or we might refer to as relevant digital service providers. And these are online search engines, online marketplaces and cloud computing services that meet certain thresholds um, established under uh, UK NIS. We then have NIS 2 um, and this is sort of a broadening of the scope of NIS 1. Um, or UK NIS. Um, and this focuses on, as we say on the slide, essential and important service providers. So NIS 2 itself sets out what would be considered essential and or uh, important service providers. And there's a few um, er sort of types of entities which are set out um, in the front end, but there are actually detailed uh, annexes, uh, there's an Annex 1 and Annex 2, which sets out these types of service providers, which often, you know, have a corresponding um, further regulation to look at in terms of how, how that is defined. Um, but this does include sort of telecoms providers, managed IT service providers, managed IT security service providers, and even sort of certain manufacturers. Uh, we have DORA, so this is a regulation focused at the financial services, and this applies directly to sort of financial service providers and what entities are uh, designated as uh, critical service providers by a regulator. We also have the ePrivacy Director and or a sort of PECA. Um, so whilst there are lots of elements that are covered by uh, the ePrivacy Directive for the purposes of today's session, um, we're thinking about uh, telecommunications providers and ISPs as they are caught within the uh, instant notification requirements. And then finally, we've got the EU AI Act. So it's a broad scope here. So we're looking at sort of at the providers, developers, which could be classed as sort of the users, authorised representatives, importers and distributors. And we should also bear in mind um, that is just a, you know, a literal reading of the direct application of some of these. There is, of course, an indirect application of some of these uh, legislations. For example, under DORA, uh, financial entities are required to sort of flow down certain terms to their ICT service providers. And then they may also look to flow down other non-mandatory elements, such as instant notification, to assist with their own legal requirements. So you might, even if you're not directly caught, be um, indirectly caught given the, your customer base. Oh, I think the slides have just been lost. We might want to just flick those back on. Brilliant. Um, so we go to the next slide. We are looking at sort of just a quick overview of the timeline to remind you all uh, where we currently are. So we've had uh, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Directive since, you know, back since 2003. Uh, 2018, we saw sort of the GDPR as well as uh, New K NIS or NIS 1 as it, as it was known. Um, it's been obviously several years since um, NIS, uh, hence where you can see in 2024, uh, we have got an update um, for the, uh, the EU for NIS 2. Um, that's obviously just not something that is applicable to the UK. Um, we are um, aware that, you know, as part of the Over Manifesto, um, that we are anticipating that something would happen in this area to improve um, or to up the ante in relation to sort of cyber prescribed cybersecurity measures um, to avoid, I guess, the UK looking like it has an open door compared to uh, EU member states once they've got uh, NIS2 in place. But that is something we are um, actively sort of following and seeing where that lands. So as I said, we've got NIS2, uh, which actually uh, the implementation deadline for member states is this week. So just as a um, heads up, NIS2 is a directive, which unlike the GDPR, it means it has to be implemented in each member state. Um, so we will have a national law in each of the 27 member states um, outlining their um, sort of local implementation of the NIS2 directive. Um, you will see that we'll go on just to mention that a couple of times later, just where you might start to see deviations under local law. Um, and then early next year, we've got uh, sort of DORA uh, in January 2025 and then the EU AI Act, which has a phased um, coming into force over sort of 36 months, uh, which starts in the January. So just onto the next slide. I apologise, the background looks a little bit funny, but we can still get through the, the main key points on this one. Uh, just before we get into those specific uh, instant notification triggers and thresholds and what they are under the different regulations, there are some really high level key points uh, to be aware of. That'd be great if uh, you took these, these away um, into your day to day practice. So you've, you've got an awareness of these. Um, Across all of these different laws, there is no harmonization of the triggers and thresholds. Um, so 
this does mean that um, we are looking at sort of a real patchwork of, of different different requirements. Uh, coupled with that, they'll mean there's no um, harmonisation of the exemptions from the requirement to notify. Um, and therefore, as a sort of linked event, you'll need instance will require an assessment on a law by law basis. Um, and this is obviously what we're going to be focusing on on this webinar. Um, so while some of those thresholds and triggers may appear quite similar, so they might all, all relate to personal data breach, for example, or they, they might um, have the same reference to sort of a significant impact, they actually could be um, slightly different, um, even if just subtle, under their different laws. Um, as a result, uh, the same incident could trigger different actions, so different actions that you'd need to take, um, as well as different enforcement under diff uh, multiple laws. Um, and therefore, just a recommendation that keep vigilant of uh, guidance and specifications for this sort of new implementations and keeping track of uh, how, how that rolls out um, as we see more and more um, of sort of uh, any enforcement action taken and or guidance from the regulators. Brilliant. So we'll move on to sort of looking at the first sort of comparison. Thanks, Charlie. So are we going to start with the GDPR? And I think um, many of you on the webinar, you'll be familiar with this. You may have even had the pain of assessing and notifying incidents to regulators. So the threshold under GDPR is that there's been a personal data breach. And uh, a personal data breach has to be notified by a processor to its controller. A controller has to notify a personal data breach if unless it's unlikely to result in risk to data subjects. Um, if they do need to notify, it's a notification to the data protection regulator. And if that risk is actually high risk to data subjects, then the controller also needs to notify the data subjects. And the timeframes for doing so are without unreasonable delay. So that's for the, the processor notifying the controller and the controller notifying data subjects. And for the controller to notify regulators, it's without undue delay and in any event within 72 hours of awareness of the incident. So if we compare that to the e-privacy directive and um, PECA, so we're still focused here on a personal data breach. However, this time it's in connection with the provision of a public electronic communication service. It's sort of slightly narrower um, in terms of scope here. Um, but again, if you meet that, that threshold and the trigger is a notification obligation to the relevant supervisory authority. Um, which is without a new delay or within the 24 hours, depending on what we're looking at, whether that's um, your privacy directive or PECA. And also, um, there is an obligation to notify the subscribers or users if it's likely to adversely affect their personal data, just privacy. And again, that's without undue delay. So I'll unpick those in a little bit more detail. So um, I mentioned uh, that the trigger was a personal data breach, and um, as did Charlie. And, and actually, under GDPR, e-privacy directive, and um, PECA, the definition of personal data breach is the same. It's the breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of, or access to personal data, which is transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. So great, there's some similarity there, but I think that's about where it ends. So when we then look at um, the, the threshold for notifying a personal data breach, we see under GDPR that it's risk or high risk is a threshold. And now that's not actually defined in the GDPR itself as to what constitutes risk or high risk. And that's where we then need to look to things like the European Data Protection Board's guidance on breach notification, to their examples that they've published on um, breaches and how to assess notifiability, but also guidance from national regulators and from ANISA, who are the European um, Security Agency and, and their guidance. As we said on the uh, previous slide, or two slides ago, um, that's that threshold for notifying um, those subscribers and users is based on an adverse impact. So sort of slightly different to looking at, you know, risk and high risk. Um, and again, uh, the similarity here is not defined. That concept of an adverse impact is not necessarily defined in the regulation itself. So we'd again look to um, local uh, or national uh, guidance on this as to whether you need to uh, be doing the notifications. 
So if we move on um, to having a look at um, UK NIS uh, with a comparison sort of directly against NIS2 here. So as you might recall on the sort of applicability side, we have sort of two areas under UK NIS. So we have those relevant digital service providers and we have those um, OES here, so operators of essential services. So as a digital service provider, if you the threshold here is you know an incident having a substantial impact on the provision of any digital services. Um, and in that case, we need to report uh, to the ICO, uh, whereas the operator of an essential service um, it has incidents that have a significant impact on the continuity of the core services they provide. And in that scenario, it would be you're reporting to um, the competent authority, so the relevant leg regulator for that specific uh, service or sector, or a CSERT. And both those scenarios, we're looking at that being without undue delay and in any event within 72 hours of awareness. Now, moving on to NIS2, the new updated regime for Europe, um, the threshold is an incident that has a significant impact on the provision of services. Um, and you would need to notify a CSERT or competent authority. And if it's going to likely adversely affect services to service recipients, then service recipients need to be notified as well. And here we have a bit of a different approach. This is um, moving into actually much more of a sophisticated approach to incident reporting under NIST 2. So what they've recognized is that it's helpful um, both you know, for information sharing with other organizations as well and with other authorities if there is an early warning. So there's, they've built in an early warning system. So you have to report within 24 hours to the, the relevant the CSERT or competent authority. So that's not, you don't have to provide details there, that's just an early warning. You then are able to report within 72 hours of um, whatever else you found out within those 72 hours, but they are recognizing under NIST 2 that actually in these early days and early hours of an incident, that there might, might be a whole load of information that you, you just don't know, and you're in the midst of gathering that information and fact finding. So what they've also built into NIST 2 is that you can give your final report within one month after your notification. So you've made like an interim report essentially within the 72 hours, and then you can make a final report um, within one month. It's a little bit similar actually to the GDPR where you can um, say uh, make a, an initial incident report and then a follow-on report. But within this, they're being very specific about when you need to make that follow-on report, which they don't under GDPR. But also helpfully, they've recognized that even one month after uh, you, you've made your initial report, you may still not have um, finished dealing with an incident. So what they've said is, if that's the case, at that one month point, you can make an interim report, so it's another interim report, and then your actual final report will follow on one month from the end of the point in which you've handled the incident. So, so it's a much more sophisticated approach to reporting. Brilliant. And then I think if we if we're looking at the um, I guess that that sort of initial trigger, um, both UK NIS and NIS2 have this concept of an incident. Um, and you'll see that there are the slight differences. Um, so under UK NIS, it is an event having an actual um, adverse effect on the security of network and information systems. So when we then compare that to NIS 2, um, we're actually, um, it, it looks a little bit similar to GDPR require, um, notification. So it's an event compromising the availability authenticity, integrity, or confidentiality of stored, transmitted, or processed data, or of the services offered by or accessible via network and information systems. So it's actually, it, it's really broadening it out. And then if we look at what that actual threshold is, so when we were looking at the digital service providers, it was thinking about a substantial impact. And what, um, 
we've now seen, you know, under uh, NIS and as Kirsten will go on to as NIS too, um, they're actually coming up with quite prescriptive um, thresholds as to what, what this actually means. So digital service providers is looking at a separate regulation, the digital service provider regulation, which sets out exactly what um, substantial would mean. And it's ensuring you have a way to measure um, those, those um, I guess, uh, items happening. Thanks, Charlie. So as Charlie said, under NIS 2, um, they've taken a very similar approach. So um, like UK NIS, um, you uh, have, and, and they're putting this into the Commission Implementing Regulations, some very, very specific triggers as to what they consider a um, significant impact and, and where that bar sits in terms of notification. Um, but the other thing to note on NIS 2, which is a real point of difference, is that um, they're not talking just about actual events. Um, they're actually talking much broadly around um, incidents that cause or actually are capable of causing severe operational disruption of services or financial loss to entities concerned, or, you, or there's an effect, or it's capable of affecting. So, um, so this is this is quite um, new. So this is really an expansion of the incident notification requirements. So you really have to be looking not just at actual events, but things that could cause those sorts of disruptions. Thanks, Kirsten. So we'll just move on to uh, Dora. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is focused on sort of the financial services sector. Um, so the threshold here we're looking at uh, for financial institutions is what we call a major ICT incident. And it, on the, in the event of a major ICT incident, uh, there's a notification obligation to the relevant competent authority. Um, and you'll notice in that time frame uh, box, we have similar uh, to what we just saw uh, for NIS2. So we get an initial notification. There's sort of what they call an intermediate report um, for significant status changes and a final report. The slight difference here is we don't have those timeframes as we did under the NIS2 directive. Um, so these timeframes uh, are to be determined by the supervisory authorities or potentially um, more detail might be um, available um, sort of in guidance or RTSs. And then in, a, in addition, we may have um, an obligation to notify a client. So the financial institution will notify their clients if uh, it has an impact on their financial interests and that is without undue delay. So just unpicking um, a little bit further on the next slide um, about what is a major ICT related incident. So um, these are definitions within definitions. So first of all, we have what is an ICT related incident. So it is a single event or it could be a series of linked events which are unplanned by the financial entity that compromises the security of the network and information systems. So it's not just looking at data. And then it has an adverse impact on the availability, authenticity, integrity, or confidentiality of data, or on the services provided by the financial entity. So again, a little bit broader. And then we get to what was a threshold, it was a major ICT related incident. So that is one of those in events or series of linked events, which has a high adverse impact on the network and information systems that support critical or important functions. So critical or important functions, again, is a defined term within um, DORA. Um, and it goes into um, the detail of, you know, what, what might be considered um, an, a function of the financial entity that is um, uh, obviously, you know, supporting a very critical or important area that could be to do with services or um, more around how they provide services to, to clients. If we go on to the next slide, there is also this concept of an operational security payment related incident. And then again, we have the second layer of a major operational security payment related incident. So we didn't cover this on the original Dora slide because um, where the uh, detailed provisions around reporting a major ICT incident are set out, it doesn't explicitly call out this major operational or security payment related incident. But we do know from another article that DORA is supposed to cover the reporting elements in relation to such incidents. So it's worth noting, but obviously just uh, a flag here that uh, it's not in the drafting is not um, super clear on this. So we have the initial part of what the incident is, it's a single event or a series of linked events which are unplanned again. Crucial here, they can be ICT related or not, but they have an adverse impact on the availability, authenticity, integrity or confidentiality of payment related data 
or on payment related services provided by the financial entity. And then similar to how we had it for a major ICT related incident, for a major operational security payment related incident, it is one of those incidents that has a high adverse impact on the payment related services provided. Um, so we'd have to be looking further at um, what um, a high adverse impact is. We should look at the next slide. Um, as with other areas, we need to be looking at further um, uh, regulation or, or uh, supporting uh, standards that are provided. So in relation to DORA, sort of looking at when you're looking at impact, whether something has an impact on the sort of services, there are separate regulatory technical standards that have been um, prepared in relation to the ICT related incidents and how you measure and sort of um, whether something has an impact or a sub sub substantial or significant and when you get to the threshold of major. So moving on to the EU AI Act. Thanks, Charlie. And I think just on, on NIS2 and DORA, um, it's, it's really becoming evident that you really need to understand the detail um, to, to understand when you've um, triggered those, those thresholds and need to report. Now, now looking at the EU AI Act, um, so this is the new piece of legislation coming down the tracks. Um, well, it, it's, it, it's around now, but it's coming into force over sort of um, in various phases over time, um, and it's going to apply to various actors, if if we want to call them that, um, with different roles around EU AI Act, and there are various different uh, incident notification obligations depending on what role you play. Uh, so if you're a provider of high risk AI then you're required to notify serious incidents to the market surveillance authority. If you're a deployer of high-risk AI, the, the trigger is a serious incident, but your notification is to the provider or the importer or distributor or relevant market surveillance authority as appropriate. Um, and also, um, if you've got reason to consider that the system presents a risk then you also need to notify that to the provider or distributor so it's in addition to actual serious incidents. Um, it's a little bit like the GDPR uh, requirement again of the processor reporting to the controller so you've got the deployer reporting to the provider and, and other ac actors in the ecosystem. If you're a provider of general purpose AI models with systemic risk then you've also got the threshold of a serious incident occurring um, and needing to report that then to the AI office, which will be, um, which will be an office which is um, commission appointed. And as appropriate, you may need to also notify competent authorities. So taking a look at the timeframes, um, so they're taking a little bit of a different approach here. So if, if it's a high risk AI, serious incident, the, the reporting timelines for the provider are immediately after establishing a causal link between the system and the incident. Um, and that includes if you think there is a reasonable likelihood that there's been a causal link. Um, and in any case, no later than 15 days of becoming aware. So that's actually a bit more permissive, um, a bit broader than the, you know, or a bit more time rather than the 72 hours under the GDPR. However, that's just the starting point. What we then have is a, um, a gradual decreasing of that time frame that you have to report the incident depending on how serious the incident is. So if there's actually been a death of a person um, and you establish or you suspect a link um, to, the, to that death, then the time limit comes down to 10 days. Um, and then if the incident is widespread um, or it's serious um, or it's causing irreversible disruption of critical infrastructure, so this is a, a nod, um, I guess, to, to the bits of legislation like NIS, which are around protecting um, uh, critical infrastructure um, and critical services, then that time frame comes down again to two days. So 
in effect, we're looking at somewhere between the, the 24 hours and the 72 hours of NIS2, for example, it, it'll be 48 hours or two days. So that's for the provider of high risk AI. And then the deployer of high risk AI and the provider of the general purpose AI model that's presenting systemic risk, they are in the shoes of something that's more akin to the processor reporting to the controls, controller, which is that they have to make their report without undue delay. And so there isn't a great deal of guidance on what, what, what is meant by without undue delay. So what is a serious incident then under the EU AI Act? Um, well, this is defined within the Act itself as an incident or malfunctioning of an AI system that directly or indirectly leads to any of the following. Um, so at its most serious, there's the death of a person or serious harm to a person's health or it could be serious or irreversible disruption of the management or operation of critical infrastructure. So again, that's the nod to the NIST type regulation. It could be infringement of obligations under union law that are intended to protect fundamental rights. Now I'll just pause on that one because actually, when you think about it, that one could be really broad. So, what about data protection leg legislation where you um, are giving people data protection rights, right to privacy under the Human Rights Act um, or other rights that you have under the Human Rights Act? So I think that's one to watch out for because you need to understand which bits of legislation are actually giving people fundamental rights um, that they're entitled to protect, which, which you could be infringing. Um, and then finally, it could also be serious harm to property or to the environment, which I thought was an interesting one. So if we move on to the next slide, Elle. Right, so, so that, that's, our, that's the detailed bit, uh, um, giving you a bit of an idea as to how all of these, these triggers and the thresholds for notification are, are actually subtly different or quite different in some cases across the from the GDPR to these new bits of tech regulation and, and why you need to be on top of it and understanding when it's been triggered. But now taking it up a level, um, we wanted to also give you some pointers and things to think about and, and, and issues to be aware of more generally. So talking about things to be aware of, that concept of awareness. In the, in the European Data Protection Board guidance, we have actually had some guidance for GDPR purposes around what the meaning of point of awareness is, um, which has been quite helpful. Um, so, you know, at what point are you aware that there has been a personal data breach? And actually, when you look at the EDPB guidance, they've built in there a little uh, buffer zone for you to do a bit of an investigation and, and come to a conclusion with a, a reasonable level of certainty that there actually has been a personal data breach. Now, when we've just we've been through these other bits of legislation, a few of them do also mention awareness. But I think one thing to really watch out for is that we don't know that regulators are going to actually um, prescribe the same meaning to that um, term of awareness and they might not treat it in the same way. So although under GDPR, we've seen that actually there is a bit of wiggle room, there is a little bit of a buffer zone, we don't know that under these other bits of legislation, you're going to get that same sort of buffer um, and um, slight bit of leeway. So that's something just to be conscious of um, when um, looking at the, the time frames for making your notification and when that clock actually starts ticking. The other thing to look out for is that although we have under various bits of legislation, privacy legislation, like um, the Data Protection Act uh, 2018 in the UK, for example, we have seen some elements of personal liability and, and criminal liability that you, you could have. Um, but it, it's not really been to the extent to, that we're now seeing under some of the new tech regulation. So um, under NIS 2, for example, um, they have actually built in personal liability 
specifically for management and actually it's quite a broad liability so under the data protection act in in the uk it's quite a narrow element that that you might be breaching where you could be personally liable under NIS 2 your the management of your organization could actually be personally liable if your organization is not complying with their obligations under NIS 2 so that's actually a very very broad sweeping um liability and one and definitely one to watch out for and to make um, your management aware of. And they've, they've clearly, they've deliberately put this into NIS2 because they, they want to find ways to make organizations comply with their obligations. And, and clearly this is a stick that they may want to use to, to make organizations do that uh, or scare, or, or scare um, uh, management of businesses and other organizations into compliance. The other thing to watch out for is that They've also built into these new bits of tech regulation um, quite a lot more of, of provisions around cooperation. So to give you an example, under NIS 2, if there is an incident that is notified, and bearing in mind NIS 2 is not just about personal data breaches, it's much broader than that. So there's, there's an incident that's been notified under NIS 2 to the relevant regulators under NIS. Now, you might have done an assessment and decided, actually, um, we don't think it's a notifiable personal data breach, even though there is some personal data involved here. Under NIS 2, the um, organizations, the authorities that have been notified of the incident, they are going to have an obligation to notify data protection regulators if they think that there is a personal data breach involved. So actually, what you might find is that um, you've made a decision that it's not notifiable under GDPR, but the regulator that you've notified to under NIS might feel that it is notifiable under GDPR, and they go and tell the data protection regulator. So I think when you're actually doing your GDPR um, incident assessment, that's another factor that you're going to need to also take into account. So you're really gonna have to think about whether um, could this be notified to another regulator even though you haven't notified it and could you then start to have questions from data protection regulators uh, along the lines of well we've been notified by such and such regulator that um, why didn't you tell us about this incident we think you should have notified it and i think that means it's going to make it much harder to make um, these sort of risk-based assessments um, and uh, and actually it's going to probably drive more notifications from uh, under data protection laws so that's one to watch out for um, but not only that they are um, notifying data protection regulators I think the other thing to watch out for is that they, they may well also be notifying other um, equivalent regulators in other jurisdictions so you might also need to um, think about where you need to be making these notifications and in what, what countries and whether you're making them to the right organizations. So the other thing to think about is the carve outs. So what we've seen under some of these new tech regulations, and I'll, I'll go into two examples, is that they are also building in some carve outs because they've recognized that actually there is some element of overlap in terms of um, security obligations and notification requirements. So under NIS 2, for example, they've said, if you ha are um, in a sector where there's some specific national legislation that already covers you with at least equivalent requirements to the NIS 2 requirements in terms of the security that you have to put in place and the notification requirements, um, and, and this might be, for example, uh, this uh, where you've got like DORA and NIS 2 apply, um, but it could be other legislation as well then they're gonna they, they can give you a carve out so you don't necessarily have to comply with uh, incident notification obligations under NIS 2 um, if these equivalent requirements apply elsewhere so it's really worth getting to grips with what these carve outs are so that if an incident happens you're not actually also making more work for yourself with notifications that you don't need to do um, and another example of that is under the EU AI Act, where they've said if if it's a high risk AI system that's listed in Annex 3, and so they've, they've got some very specific types 
of AI that are listed there, or if that AI is part of a safety component in a device, then the EU providers that are subject to equivalent reporting laws under a different legislation, again, um, you're not going to need to notify that's more broadly, apart from certain very serious types of incidents, and they list those incidents in the EU AI Act. So again, there's a carve out, so you might not necessarily need to notify under the EU AI Act. So again, um, you know, good, good to know what those carve outs are and whether they apply to you um, and your high risk AI. The other thing I would mention is that um, some things may appear the same, but in fact, they're different. So under DORA, it, it talks about notifying the competent authority, and that may appear to be the case that everyone has to notify the competent authority. It's the same authority. Um, there we go. Let's notify that one authority. But actually, when you look at the detail of DORA, the competent, competent authority is a different authority depending on the type of financial organisation you are. Um, and you've got something similar under the likes of UK NIS, where you've got um, reporting to the ICO if you're a digital service provider, but if you're a provider of essential services, you might need to report to a regulator in your sector. So again, this is another area where it's really good to do your mapping in advance of an incident so that you understand exactly which regulator you um, need to make your notifications to if a notification is due. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Elle. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so I appreciate that we have provided a lot of information um, and I hope really highlighted that lack of harmonisation that I mentioned at the beginning across the sort of incident notification thresholds, triggers, and then what is what is expected um, from you. So as we're sort of drawing towards the end of uh, the session, I thought it'd be useful just to highlight some of the key next steps that we would recommend um, to help you know, organisations be more prepared. Um, so the first one on the list, you know, data and systems mapping. Um, we'll have all, uh, no doubt, uh, been reminded constantly of sort of data mapping for GDPR. But as we will have covered in today's session, it's much broader than sort of just personal data and knowing um, where that is and where it's going and where it's stored. We need to understand generally um, all, all the data that you are holding, where it is, who has access to it. Um, the systems and networks you're using, you'd have seen that, you know, uh, quite a few of the uh, laws we've spoken about, including those two, you know, is focused on um, network and systems. Um, identifying which of those are critical to the services, but also having an awareness of sort of the suppliers, um, your subcontractors that are involved. Um, so you can work out, you know, if there's um, obligations which you might want to be flowing down to them as and when you've got to that stage. Um, next up, we sort of look at an applicability assessment. So looking to understand from each of the each of the regulations that we had on today, and um, there are others in the tech reg space that have that are already in force or coming into force, um, to understand whether you're caught by them and, and to what extent. Um, so just because you are within the scope of um, one of these uh, regulations, so you're NIS 2, for example, there may be slight differences if you are an essential or important entity or um, under door if you're in indirectly um, is applicable to you that might be uh, have considerations um, and we've been helping clients carry out some of those applicability um, assessments under different uh, regulations and um, linked to that then is once you know to what extent you are caught there may be registration requirements uh, this is currently sort of mainly I'm thinking here about um, NIS2 um, there are registration requirements set out at the directive level um, and then they are also additional um, registration requirements under national um, national law. Um, so that might be requiring you to register with the local regulator um, for your service to buy a certain date. Um, if I'm honest, some of these dates have passed, so for um, or they're coming up. So I think for Hungary, I think um, the, the deadline is, is uh, looking at this week. Um, and we, as we get sort of more and more countries implementing their local law, um, I'm sure we'll see more deadlines um, coming up. Um, and then linked to this, so looking at the you know policies and procedures and review of those. So if we're looking at these incident management steps, uh, I'm sure many organisations have sort of some some form of an incident management um, response policy or procedure that they um, try to follow uh, when this an event an incident occurs or a potential incident. But as we've seen today, there are so many. Um, 
different triggers and thresholds that needs to be borne in mind. So it's not only making sure that once that um, trigger or threshold has been met, you've got a um, a policy or procedure and to show you what, what, what to follow and what you should be doing, but also making sure that there are processes in place that you can actually measure those thresholds. Um, can you measure that there is a series of linked events that has then met the incident threshold? You might have already, you know, a way of um, monitoring a single event, but not actually to link those together. Um, I think some of the things that consider around significant impact are looking, are sometimes looking at availability, as we've used in a couple of our examples. So how are you measuring and uh, tracking that availability of services that will then link in to there being a, um, an in, a potential incident that needs analysis under the incident um, notification requirements. Um, security measures, as sort of Kirsten mentioned at the beginning, um, we can see that we're moving from sort of that principle-based security uh, requirements that we have under GDPR to some sort of specific um, requirements, more under sort of DORA and NIS2. Um, and we're working with clients now to sort of, you know, I guess, look at what those requirements are, um, carry out a gap analysis of what what uh, they already have in place and um, what is then missing or not compliant um, and looking at sort of remediation steps for those. Um, as Kirsten was just mentioning, you know, have, being aware of what your instant notification thresholds are and linked to the next one, your regulators that you would need to notify, having as much of this done uh, now rather than the event of an incident, um, when you have sort of short time scales on which to report, um, it's much more preferable to sort of be, a, be ahead of that. And then finally, uh, looking at training. Um, so our slide sort of says, you know, for all staff, um, it is worth noting that under NIS2, there is actually a, uh, an obligation to have cybersecurity uh, risk management training for your management body. But, you know, our recommendation would be that there is some training and that be, you know, um, tailored to the different audiences, but that is available for all staff, which allows them to recognize when an incident happened, um, if that is the relevant uh, threshold, um, on how they report that internally, but also something more um, specialized for an incident response team, whether that's running sort of a, a tabletop exercise, um, and but also yeah as i said looking at that management uh, body and having that um the specific training um, in place for them as well so moving on i think to just looking at some tools and resources in the wider tech reg space i'll hand over to l thanks Charlie. i'll just jump in there just to say um uh, one of the other things that came out of the um the ibm's cost of the data breach report is the link between Basically, um, being being ready <laughs> for an incident and 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 uh, having a plan for responding to it can actually uh, significantly reduce the cost to businesses of dealing with an incident. So, L, over to you. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, yeah. So now to just a sort of list of some helpful resources and tools that we have on offer. Um, so you can sign up to our digital regulation updates um, and we also have a horizon scanner mailing list and also legislation and proposed legislation timeline trackers which are really helpful. So if we just um, give everyone a little peek inside of those if you move on to the next slide. For us, Al. Can you see the next slide? Oh, I'm not seeing it, is it? I don't know if it's just me. No. There we go. Yeah, we've got we've got the NIS2 slide. Perfect. So right. yes. You can also subscribe to our NIS2 implementations tracker, which is helpful um, just to be able to see which countries have implemented the NIS2 directive into local law. I think quite a lot are going to miss the deadline, aren't they? Yeah, I've got quite a few uh, countries still to go on uh, the deadlines, uh, given that we are looking uh, for this week. Um, but um, I think we have um, we are expecting several before Christmas uh, still. We also offer a range of webinars on digital regulation, which are available on our YouTube page. 
and these include our EU AI Act series of webinars from our colleagues in our tech and data team across the EU, UK and the US. And also on YouTube, we have our data team webinars on various different privacy topics, including Get Data Protection Fit, um, and that's a webinar series. Yep, so plenty of materials on our YouTube channel for anyone who's interested. Um, we're in the midst, um, so we, we started the EU AI Act series. It was so popular um, that we've actually extended it and we're, we're still continuing with that. But when we do webinars, we typically put them onto our YouTube channel so you can find those that have gone before um, there. And if you are interested in signing up to our EU AI Act series um, and joining us for those, the the, the the ones that are coming up, then you can subscribe. Um, and um, if you're interested in any of these things, then please do get in touch with us and we're very happy to help you out and get you onto mailing lists or send you relevant information. Uh, now, just a word on um, tools and resources that may well help you. Now, at Field Fisher, we so we, we've worked on many, many uh, data breaches with clients and we understand the pain points and um, how difficult it can be to uh, gather all the information that you need um, and, and deal with the breach very, very quickly. Um, so we've actually created our own uh, tool in um, collaboration with a third party provider, Lawcadia, uh, to help with managing breaches and due to popular demand we've expanded out the functionality of this tool so this tool will be um you know, is very helpful and the incident reporting assessment piece is going to be very transferable to other pieces of legislation as well um, but it will also be helpful for data and systems mapping which i think is going to be really important to understanding what you're doing with data and what your systems are within the organization and therefore um, if you have an incident um, being able to assess your incident under all of these bits of tech tech legislation as well as data protection legislation um, and our tool um, because also due to popular demand um, it also includes other functionality so if you're um, you're trying to do your transfer impact assessments or data protection impact assessments and uh, you're fed up of lots of um, Word documents and Excel spreadsheets and the like flying around, um, then we, we also um, offer the functionality of doing that within this tool. Uh, there's lots of information on our website about the um, data breach manager and if you're interested in finding out more, then you can also uh, contact us and we can send you some more information on that. I think that leaves us just a little bit of time for some questions. Now, please feel free to send in your questions um, to us. Um, now, let me have a look. Oh, now, there's a there's an interesting question. I think Charlie, this is this is probably one for you. Um, so, can you notify? breaches so yeah, I think this goes to the point about you know being unsure and doing your assessment can you notify breaches if you're not sure whether they are notifiable or even if you think they're not notifiable um, I think it's a really interesting question and we have often had it previously just under the GDPR where we've got that short window to notify and sort of working out what what we do do we hold on because we're not quite sure yet and potentially miss the deadline sort of 72 hour mark or do we you know prematurely notify and actually it's not a, it's not um the past data breach at all and we didn't need to sort of uh, raise any concerns with the regulator um i i am going to be a typical lawyer and not give a um, clear response here because i think it really depends on the specific regulation so um, under the GDPR, we have seen regulators, um, you know, trying to discourage that over-reporting. It obviously adds to their burden um, and things they need to review, but we have been discouraged from sort of, you know, continuing the over-reporting um, and doing that. However, other regulations um, we're taking sort of, or other laws, we're taking slightly different approaches. So the example I have is um, under DORA, um, there is this provision around sort of I guess a voluntary voluntary notifications in relation to those items which don't actually um, meet 
that threshold of a major ICT rated incident. So you can report or give you give a notification um, in relation to a significant cyber threat, which um, again is a, is a is a defined term under under DORA, um, and organisations may want to. Um, do a voluntary notification in that regard um, and the text of DORA does go into some detail around um, why I guess you might want to um, look look to, to notify in that sense but it's yeah it's one of those that it's more focused on um, the different regulations rather than a clear uh, approach of yes we can voluntarily notify under all of them. Uh, so it's interesting isn't it that um unlike the GDPR where um, you know some regulators are trying to discourage notification that is completely different isn't it with the new bits of tech reg we're now seeing actually more encouragement of notification but I guess that's also to do with um, you know the, the more informed the more we share information across organizations and countries the the better prepared we can be to deal with cyber incidents Agree, and I think that comes back to a little bit around sort of the intention of, you know, DORA being something to, you know, as as the acronym suggests, you know, protect the operational resilience of the financial services sector. So, given that those, um, we want to make sure that if it's a significant cyber threat, it could have a, a major impact, um, or it could, you know, it's a, even if it wasn't major for that one um, financial uh, entity, it could, you know, have others have experienced it. So, sort of more of that information sharing in that cybersecurity space, um, uh, in that regard, or have, being a sort of ahead of any incident which could have uh, an impact on the resilience of the financial services sector. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see uh, what, how much voluntary notification there actually is, because of course there's also, um, I think there's going to be nervousness around well. Um, yes, it might all be very helpful for everybody to, for me to voluntary, voluntarily notify um, a breach that my organisation suffered, but are you then actually potentially going to be drawing the attention of regulators and investigations and um, them second guessing whether you've actually, you've got, you've got your assessment right, that it, it was a voluntary notification, not that you should have mandatorily notified it. So uh, it'd be helpful if we got some um, guidance from regulators on that around um, how they're going to approach that and enforcement um, although I'm not expecting that will be forthcoming so we'll just have to wait and see how that all develops. Um, so I've got another question here um, yeah so the question is, so are there any requirements as there are um, the same as they are for GDPR on what should be included in notifications so that's so a good question because actually there are um, and um, they're not the same. <laughs> um, so the various different bits of tech regulation have actually um, given some pres very prescriptive lists of the things that you need to put into your notifications. Um, and then when you when you look across the bits of legislation, the list of information that you need to provide isn't actually completely the same. Um, with with the, the the new tech regulation, there is also, for example, um, you know, requirements around um, providing information on the the cross border impact of an incident, and that's really very much about us, you know, across or, or Europe, looking across the board on impacts across Europe. Um, so so you do need to watch out for that and uh, really map what it is that you need to put into your notifications. And I think the other thing to watch out for as well is that there is also um, uh, various different regulators may well be publishing forms and you know prescribed formats in which you need to make your notifications. So it's a good would be a good thing to get on top of all of that as well. So I think. Yeah, and I um, so go on, Charlie. Yep. I was going to say on, on like the DORA aspect, I think um, the expectation is that will be a sort of a regulatory technical, technical standard um, will set out, you know, the content of the reports um, and what should be uh, specified um, as well as those time limits. So, mm. as I, which really, really does demonstrate we really need to, you know, be all over the, the, the detail yes, of this. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, to understand our requirements. Uh, <clears throat> So I think I'll probably leave it there because we've got, only got a minute to go for, um, uh, so I think I'll leave it there for questions. Um, and Elle, if you just move us on to the final slide, uh, there we go. Leaving you 
or with our contact details. So as I said, so um, I'm Kirsten Whitfield, um, and you've been um, hearing from Charlie Guile and L Callum. If you want to get in touch with us, our contact details are there. Um, and, you know, please do reach out. And thank you everybody who joined us and um, this webinar will be going up on YouTube so if you want to share it with any of your colleagues or anybody else then um, you know feel free to point them towards our YouTube channel and on that note I shall say goodbye thank you everybody